Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I am the science coordinator for the partnership. I want to thank you all for making time to be with us today. Our webinar today is on ecophysiological species distribution models and future extinction risk of reptiles and amphibians. Our presenter is Dr. Barry Sinervo from the University of California in Santa Cruz. And I want to let you know that the Desert LCC has several teams that we call critical management question teams. And our webinar today is being hosted by the uh, critical management question number four team. Uh, which is looking at the physiological impacts of climate change on species. But it also relates to another of our teams, our CMQ6 team, which is looking at the vulnerability of amphibians and reptiles, um, that specific taxonomic group, to climate change. So welcome. Um, our presenter, Barry Sonervo, is a full professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He is an evolutionary biologist who conducts research on behavioral ecology, game theory, and biotic impacts of climate change. He received his HBSC from Dalhousie University with a double major in mathematics and biology, his PhD from the zoology department at the University of Washington, and he was a Miller Research Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. He is currently researching contemporary extinctions of reptiles and amphibians and changes in plant communities driven by climate change at sites distributed on five continents, leading a multinational research team of scientists developing physiological models of the biotic impacts of climate change on diverse biological systems and measuring the biotic impacts of climate from equatorial sites to polar regions. He also runs an REU sites program at UC Santa Cruz each summer and gives workshops on climate change science at institutions around the world. He is also director of the UC-wide Institute for the Study of the Ecological and Evolutionary Climate Impacts, a research consortium funded by a UC Presidential Research Catalyst Award. So thank you very much for being with us today, Barry, and I will hand things over to you to start the presentation. Great, thanks, Amy, and thanks for all of those in attendance. I'm going to be presenting some of the methods that I've developed with colleagues around the world. So you'll actually see uh, examples from various continents, but uh, these methods we're going to begin implementing for the DLCC um, across the uh, Arizona, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, as well as Mexico landscape. And um, we're going to be working mainly on certain targeted taxa that are, that are quite common, but we also have some endangered species in the mix. And um, working with others um, in the coming years, we're hoping to develop more and more of these um, endangered species assessments. So let's see if I can get this going. Uh -huh. There we go. So this, my, my involvement in the extinctions of these um, reptiles began with the uh, work in this paper that we published in Science in 2010. But the actual studies we, we um, initiated actually began in Europe first. In 2001, we began researching European common lizards, and I'll show you some of that work. In 2007, I shifted over to some collaborations with a, a large group of Mexican researchers, and we weren't really in, investigating climate change per se. We were interested in um, some other issues of evolutionary biology, speciation, and um, it, whimsically, the rock, paper, scissors game, where I, I studied the um, interactions of color morphs and how they develop a mating system dynamics. But during those studies, we actually observed that many populations were um, locally extinct. And the reason we could figure that out was we were working on phylogenies, and people had surveyed all these populations before. Notably in that group was Jack Seitz, who had actually begun on some of these studies in the um, 1980s with his work in Mexico. So in Mexico, we had a diverse set of taxa that we were studying. And uh, you can see it's for, uh, from the abstract, 48 Mexican lizard species across 200 sites. And from that, we were able to estimate the contemporary extinction risk and then develop a, a model of that extinction risk assessment based on physiological traits. Now, people have had this idea for a while, notably my 
PhD advisor, Ray Huey, had been developing these ideas of applying physiology. And in fact, in a previous publication, he had suggested that tropical lizards were at great risk of extinction. So in some measure, this was inspired by the work that Ray and others had done on the ecophysiological perspective. And what we did was, and since then, now in this talk, I'm going to show you how we've actually essentially codified these principles and, and wrapped them directly into a species distribution modeling framework. So this is the um, pattern of extinctions in the contemporary. Um, and you can see that we're, we have little dots showing up in Mexico for extinctions. But if you look right now, there are large regions of the equatorial tropics that are under great extinction risk in the 2009 panel. And so we wrote to NSF and developed a research grant for, um, and it was funded at uh, $2 million to investigate all of these extinctions across the globe, going from polar regions down to the equatorial tropics. In this initial model, you can see that we project a very dismal pattern for the equatorial tropics, but it's expanding outside of that into the dry, wet tropics. And, and then on into 2080, we see tremendous numbers of local population extinctions. And it's a, it's a fairly simple matter to translate local population extinctions into total species extinctions by essentially extrapolating once the known locations of a species have gone extinct, you have a species extinction. And these models, the first generation models, don't really assume that we have range expansions going on. The latest models that I show you will allow for the possibility of range expansion. So that we have a pretty complete picture developing about what the pattern of extinctions might look like. So this, this was actually the alarming pattern um, that Ray had projected with regards to his proceedings of the Royal Society paper with a number of other colleagues where they posited that a group of lizards that are called thermal conformers because they essentially live at ambient temperatures in tropical forests um, may be at the greatest risk of extinction compared to heliotherms. Now, one of the things that Ray noted was that they have very different um, ecophysiological um, uh, limits, and that's because the tropical lizards are very finely ad adapted to very narrow range of temperatures. And as temperatures increase, then they're going to go extinct. In this panel, I show you what the pattern of projected extinctions looks like in the tropical regions. And you see that there is a lower probability of taxon survival. And across on the right, you'll see all the lizard families that we use to develop these extinction risk es estimates. And what you have to appreciate is that there are actually eight lizard families for which we ground truth the local population extinction. So we actually ground truth the extinctions for about 20% of the taxa. And so what that means is that we are already observing those extinctions in some of these taxa, and all we're doing now is just extrapolating the projections to other taxa. But if you look by 2050, you see this extinction hole deepen, and by 2080, it's actually quite disastrous, nearly reaching 50% in the equatorial tropics. And on the, on the panel, I also show you the individual family lines, and whenever you see a line touch the zero, that means that an, a lizard family has gone extinct. It's for these reasons that we're now referring to this as the sixth mass extinction event observed in reptiles if, if, if these projections come to pass. We're going to see entire lizard families, potentially up to eight lizard families go extinct. Now, these aren't the most diverse of the lizard families. They contribute to family level diversity. But these are families that tend to have very small numbers of members in their, in their uh, family, like the Lanthanotas, which are a sister group to the Varanids. Varanids are those things we know of as guanas. And the, the Lanthanotas are um, a monotypic genus, right? So there's one species in that entire family. That goes extinct, but a number of other families with a few members in them go extinct. And then following on their heels are very large families as well. So as the paper was coming out, I, you know, you can't believe that things are as disastrous as, as that projection. And so I actually went out into California to ground truth the model and see if it was actually as accurate as, as it seems. So here as in the lower left, left, you see a plot of the partial species distribution range of the side blotch lizard in the United States. And what you can see is that there are some red spots showing up on the map. Um, and these red spots reject, 
reflect where we would project extinctions based on the ecophysiology, the evolved body temperature of the lizards, and, and some simple concepts of how the body temperature relates to operative environmental temperatures. I'll talk about that. The critical parameter that we used in these early models was hours of restriction. And now we've expanded upon this to use hours of activity and hours of restriction. So the hours when lizards can be active given the body temperature that they have. Now, what's useful about the model is first it projects extinctions. So of the 4,000 unique sites of the side blotch lizard, we had a set of sites that we could visit and adjacent sites that we could visit to see whether the model was actually accurate. And the model's hypothetical deductive falsifiable if we visit those sites and the extinctions are not observed, that kind of gives us an idea of how reliable the model is. Well, in this, in this um, extinction forecast, um, the three taxa that I'm going to show you, um, the model has a reliability of 86%. The model is also hypothetically, uh, hypothetical deductive falsifiable from the perspective of the ecophysiological traits underlying what we project extinctions. Um, to be, to be driving those extinctions. So if we zoom in, I went on a research expedition down to Death Valley, and all, all I had to do was visit sites. And because I'm a lizard expert, I can, and this was the side blotch lizard, with a lizard that I have great familiarity with, I could visit sites pretty rapidly, just a few hours per site when the lizards are in prime time, when they're expected to be out. And I visited some sites here in Death Valley that are in red, as well as a bunch of adjacent sites, so a total of 24 sites over a, a week or so, and found that the model exactly predicted the observed extinctions in the side blotch lizard. Now, the other part of the model that's hypothetical um, deductive falsifiable is, is the notion that we predicted that there should be a critical hours of restriction, which is at the four hour um, mark. That is to say, if, if the side blotch lizard is pushed into retreat sites, for greater than four hours, it should be extinct at those sites. And in fact, if you look at the hours of restriction at those extinct sites, it was crawling above that level. If you looked at the immediately adjacent sites to these um, predicted sites, um, you see that it's below that level. So there are many populations of the side blotch lizard, as you can see, that are going to persist. The point here is that of the 4,000 sites, we could narrow it down to a set of sites. In this case, we actually um, have a, more than the 24 that I did in the original Death Valley surveys. We have a total of about 50 sites across the Mojave landscape as well as some of the desert sites where we've surveyed and now the model is actually incredibly accurate for the side blotch lizard in predicting extinctions. Another point is that you can go anywhere in a species range and find local population extinctions and we've done that again um, for other taxa. The other thing that I observed, and this was where it became kind of important from the point of view of the NSF panel where we received funding, was that we also observed the death of important components of the community, like the dying mesquite here that I show you, at exactly those extinct sites. Now mesquite is an incredibly robust plant with roots that tap down 100 meters or so into the soil. And so it's quite startling when you see dead and dying mesquite, and those dead and dying mesquite are exactly coincident with the extinctions of these reptiles. So I'm going to just amplify on that with another survey. Robert Cooper began um, work with me on a thesis at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and he began surveying sites around the Mojave here. You can see uh, there are a number of sites that we could choose, but we highlight in red those where we've observed extinctions. And you can see that there are a number of sites. And since then, we've discovered another site right here uh, near the prow of the Mojave, which actually turns out to be my PhD research site. It kind of goes to show that extinctions can actually have a very personal impact. Um, my PhD research site, the low elevation site, where I was studying the physiology of the lizards at their distributional limit in the Mojave, has now gone extinct. But Robert began his thesis and then looked at those sites, and he saw that at the extinction sites, the hours of restriction had again had gone above critical. And then another thing that we observed was um, that there were dead and dying pinion pines at the sites. So we cached that information. This is um, a, a lizard to the north in northern California called the alligator uh, lizard. It's the northern alligator lizard, which, as indicated on this slide, is viviparous. It gives birth to live young. One of the things about the model is that you can build in all kinds of interesting 
ecophysiology. One, one thing we know about the, um, this group of lizards is that for the viviparous taxa, they evolve a lower body temperature. And um, that's true for the lizards of Mexico as well as these alligator lizards. But also importantly, alligator lizards, because they're viviparous, the females have to be pregnant all during the summer. And what that means is that they are ex potentially exposed to much higher temperatures during pregnancy, during the summer months, and that may in fact exacerbate the extinction risk. So these are physiological principles that we can build into the extinction risk modeling. And what I did was, again, I predicted where the extinctions are in California, and I predicted extinctions literally in my backyard here in Aptos, as well as at sites um, adjacent to the University of California, and now we've been surveying those sites. I just got back to a site up near Onionuevo um, where a student working with Gage Dayton, who's a, um, he's the director of the um, Natural Reserve System at the University of California, and his student Elliot has been studying one of these extinction lines that we're following. There is a, a, a line separated by a kilometer where we have the northern alligator lizard appears to be, be uh, replaced by the southern alligator lizard. You can look at the historical records and you can see that the, the Santa Cruz County was a stronghold for the alligator lizards that are from the north. Um, and there were sporadic instances of su southern alligator lizards in Santa Cruz County. And now those regions have begun expanding. And now we're trying to map this. The thing about the alligator lizards is it's not an ideal species to survey for extinctions because they're so secretive. So it's much more elaborate. We have to put out board lines, and we're developing a system whereby we put out board lines so we can monitor the ongoing progress of this extinction over the next decade. So that's going to take a while to figure out. But for the extinctions that we think have already happened, we looked at the hours of restriction at those sites, and they've critically gone above that six-hour limit. Now, the limit for these lizards is slightly different than the fence lizards. Each family has its own um, family-specific level critical level, and that's driven by the distribution of the species. So here we, we see that the species distribution is dr driven by evolved physiology, evolved life history attributes, and of course dictated by the exact location of those taxa given their adaptation in, in thermal physiology. So that's the essence of what these species distribution models are, are um, doing. So here we have um, at these sites, we also see a bunch of dead and dying pines, and those sites are uh, those sites are those sites are um, places immediately adjacent to the um, extinctions of the lizards. And what what's also interesting from the point of view of these dead and dying pines is that they also triggered a massive fire event that was known as the summit. Summit Fire, and um, the Summit Fire essentially burned not all of the habitat where we've been surveying the extinction, so we see the remnants of the dead and dying pines, but it um, was of a scale that it could potentially convert the pine forest into a chaparral landscape. If the pines fail to recruit after, after this fire event and the landscape that becomes sort of this uh, maritime chaparral dominated landscape, then we're going to see a, a, a complete loss of the alligator lizards from this, the northern alligator lizards. And we've already seen that in the areas that where it appears to be um, in the process of conversion to maritime chaparral as the pines continue the die-off, um, those areas are now areas where the southern alligator lizard, this egg-laying species, has now recruited and expanded its range. So the process of this extinction can actually be accelerated by these plant events. And so we began this study of these um, plant die-off events that seem to be associated with extinctions. And um, this just shows you a list of sites that we've now finished for this National Science Foundation grant. And you can see that we have extinctions recorded on all the continents, and we've been now measuring the operative environmental temperature changes. These, these lizard models that mimic the thermal properties of um, real lizards and when we apply the observed differ uh, differences in body temperature that the lizards experience. And at the bottom, you can see now we're starting to um, begin these more detailed surveys across the desert south southwest this spring with the DLC surveys. 
And I'm actually going to be going to Nevada, like on the weekend, um, to visit the Desert Tortoise Council meetings and present a talk there. But while I'm there, I'm going to begin measuring the ecophysiology of some amphibian extinctions that have been observed in southern Nevada. So around the world, we see that there's a tremendous concordance between the plant die-offs. And here you see in Europe, we have places where we have literally exact locations where lizards have gone extinct. We see one of the species, Fraxinus excelsior, um, has essentially a pattern of die-off that seems to be tightly correlated with the lizards. But we have these die-off events in the Sierras in California with um, gray pines. They seem to be tightly associated with the extinctions of the um, alligator lizards. And here we have mesquite die-offs die that are associated with um, desert species. Then if we go to the southern hemisphere, we have mesquite die-offs. It's the same genus, Prosopis. And um, we see that the mesquite die-offs are exactly associated with extinctions of live-bearing lizards in the southern hemisphere, as well as some egg-laying lizards. But the live-bearing lizards are at great risk. Then we have die-offs in notophagus forests in Chile and Argentina that seem to be associated with a number of lizard extinctions there. And we've begun now work in Australia um, down in the southern hemisphere to see if that pattern is consistent. And we also have begun work in Africa, though I haven't yet been to Africa to do the plant um, ecophysiology, though we plan on an expedition this, this coming fall. Where incidentally, um, in, in Africa, Ray Huey went back to the study sites that he, did, he worked on as a master's student back in the 1970s with Eric Pianca. And we've now seen some extinctions at uh, Ray's master's student sites. And so you can see how deeply personal some of these extinctions are. There's a whole cadre of um, herpetologists of the age of about 50 or 60 who began their work in the 1980s. And at those sites where they did their PhD research, you've, we've now observed extinctions of, of the taxa. And for all intents and purposes, the habitat appears to be otherwise intact except for these um, plant die-offs that we see. So the, the reason you get this linkage and potentially a, an exacerbated effect of, of um, the plant die-offs is that as the plants die off themselves, you see that you get more incident solar radiation. So you get higher body temperatures for the reptiles and amphibians. There may be greater water loss rates, and the soil becomes drier. And in the um, NSF grant, we also included the um, fish assessments, but um, during the funding uh, crisis, uh, our grant was cut by 20% um, by, uh, or so, so we had to knock out the fish research. It was, it was uh, a pity because there are also parallel patterns of ectothermic extinctions in all the fish groups across all these continents. Well, we're trying to kind of bootstrap that work with some other researchers locally. So for, we've been focusing now for the, the last three years, four years now, since the publication of that, on reptiles and amphibians. This kind of shows you um, uh, one of the species that was one of the first species where we identified extinctions, the European common lizard. We found that there were 15 extinctions across 115 sites that we surveyed, and here I show you those sites. Uh, and here, this is also a species that is both live-bearing. The top panel shows a live-bearing species, uh, not species, they're in a species complex. And then there are egg-laying taxa distributed across Europe. The egg-laying taxa seem to be found in the southern parts of the range, and the live-bearing taxa are found in the northern parts of the range. And this is where our research goes above the Arctic Circle, because we're planning on expeditions up to the Arctic Circle of Finland in coming years, where the the live-bearing species may, in fact, be expanding its range. This shows you why you get precise extinctions associated with plant die-off. You can see that on the left panel, we have Fraxinus excelsior, and on the right panel, we have the European common lizard, and you see they have nearly a concordant species distribution with a small corridor that breaks up the European common lizard range in the south in southern France, and that's because the European common lizard requires um, bogs for their habitat, and uh, Fraxinus excelsior is often found around those bogs. But in the south of France, there's a lot of limestone, so there's no bog development. So there's a little break in the distribution of the European common lizard, but it is present in the Pyrenees in exactly those same areas where you find Fraxinus excelsior. So if you think about species distributional limits, they have roughly the same species distribution. 
And plants and lizards may have similar analogous species distribution limits. So we have a whole research program underway with collaborators looking at the ecophysiological tolerances of plants. And that work is really um, underway right now. We should have results to report after a year or so. Um, in, in terms of the modeling refinements, we've already begun this work where we use um, normalized difference vegetation index from satellite data to actually project where plants may be suffering. And um, in work that was local to California, a student in my lab, Joseph Stewart, um, has been working on the blunt-nosed leopard lizard, an endangered species. And he finds a very precise linkage between NDVI that's been registered in the last couple of years because of this intense drought that California has been undergoing and the lack of recruitment of the blunt-nosed leopard lizard, an endangered species. And so we're seeing that we're getting this tight tie-off between plant communities and reptile communities, and in particular, some of these communities that are on the ropes. This is research that we're doing in, in collaboration with Cam Barrows, Joseph Stewart, um, Mike uh, Westfall, and um, a number of others, including TNC uh, with Scott Butterfield. Um, this shows you uh, the, why you get um, plant die-offs. This is just some work we've been doing with Gophrys agazizii, but this was actually data that Medica, Phil Medica published on one particular site where you see the relationship between winter rain and annual biomass. And so there's a very precise linkage between annual rainfall, which is a, a, something you can get from climate data, and annual biomass, which is what the um, desert tortoise feeds on. But you could then couple this directly to NDVI records for these sites as well, this site that they have in the desert. And that's what we're trying to do with this particular site, and then use this information across the range of these um, desert tortoise. So I'll talk more about the desert tortoise at the end. It's a pretty iconic species. This just shows you a panel, um, another approach we're using. This is the output from John Bergegren's equilibrium vegetation um, ecology model, and it, he can, from kind of biophysical and competition principles and the like, um, reconstruct what the current day plant biomes are for the region that we're, we're talking about right now for the DLCC. So he's already done these um, modeling constructions for us. And then we can also project into the future what's going to happen to those plant communities. Now, those changes in, in John's model may take, you know, a long period of time to come about. But we can look at what he projects as we'll, what will be in equilibrium with climate, say, in 50 years. And we actually project that if we see um, a mismatch between the current vegetation that's projected for an area and what should be in equilibrium, say in 2020, what should be in equilibrium, we should actually see plant stresses occurring and we should see die-off. So we should be able to use this model as well to project where plant die-off events are occurring and where we may see this acceleration due to climate change. What I'm going to show you now are four um, new ecophysiological models um, for the reptiles and amphibians that we've developed during the National Science Foundation grant and that we're now applying to the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative this, starting this spring and the collaborators are listed below. Um, so the, the really nice thing about these species distribution models is that um, you don't need a lot of physiology if you don't have a lot of physiology. Um, I'm going to show you some very accurate met methods that we've developed from the point of view of reconstructing species distributions from a demographic perspective. Those are essentially the state-of-the-art uh, methods because what you're doing is you're, you have a completely mechanistic model of physiology on up to demographic principles, and the demographic principles then project extinctions. But the other methods that I'm going to show you are actually, you could call them quick and dirty, but you just require some information on hours of restriction or hours of activity as a function of evolved body temperature. Despite the fact that they're so quick and dirty, they can actually develop very high precision, high AIC scores. And the reason why is that um, they not only build in the information on these ecophysiological traits, but they also essentially bundle together um, the information across important parts of the phenology, in this case breeding season, post-breeding season. So 
they also bundle in precipitation as it impacts a given species, like the desert tortoise feeding on vegetation, or the blunt-nosed leopard lizard that may receive um, um, cover for thermoregulation and then allows it to extend its foraging hours even if it's hot. Um, now, what's really nice is that because it's mechanistic, we can compress. You know, the 36 climate variables, which would be T min and T max during the 12 months of the year, plus precipitation. And we're also trying to build in relative humidity. So we really have four that we're trying to, four variables that we're trying to build in across the 12 months of the year. But instead of compressing those into what would be the 19 bioclimate variables that um, Robert Hyman's has developed, which are a very useful tool, where you don't really understand ecophysiology, you can use those. But we can compress those into four physiological parameters. And, and what that means is that you can develop a species distribution model with far fewer inputs. And what that does is because you're using less information, you're essentially building a structural model of climate and its effects on physiology. It uses less information. And what that does is that jacks up the AIC scores um, because you're essentially using the information more efficiently with some forethought as to the physiology. And that generates a much higher predictive power as well. It turns out that not only are the AIC scores higher, but the AUC scores, which is the area under the curve, which is often used to assess species distribution models, are also actually quite high. And I'll discuss some examples later on. So there are four ways to fit these ecophysiological species distribution models. The first is the one that we used in the science paper where we just used thermal preference, but now we expand it to hours of restriction and hours of activity and precipitation in some way setting the species range. The second way is to use much more information about thermal, uh, the thermal performance curve as well as precipitation during and after the breeding season. These methods assume that performance, and I'll show you examples of performance, it's a proxy for population dynamics. The method three actually builds in more ecophysiology. We use thermal and hydric performance curves and precipitation during and after the breeding season. And we assume that performance in this case is also a, pro po uh, a proxy for population lambda. Now the final method is the most accurate. And it was the method that we used to essentially develop these um, simpler methods. And this is the full demographic model. And we apply this to the desert tortoise, Gophrys agazizii, in this example. But it turns out now we have almost full information for the desert tortoise, um, Gophrys morafkai, in Arizona. And for the DLCC, we're going to do the um, assessment using a full demographic model for the desert tortoise. This turns out to be pretty important because the desert tortoise, Gophrys, um, the morafka's desert tortoise, Gophrys morafkai is undergoing a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service assessment currently. This shows you a, one of these accurate species distribution, uh, these performance curves. So this is body temperature on the x-axis and jumping speed. And this is one that I'm working on with Leo Basigalupe in Chile. And this is the four-eyed frog, aptly named. You can see these little little um, pouches that pop out at the back, it simulates eye spots so that the predator might attack the rear end of the frog and the frog can get away. But let's look at the um, thermal performance curve. This shows you all of the individual thermal performance curves for the four-eyed frog <coughs> in um, one population in Chile. And on that are various <coughs> metrics that are used by people for ecophysiology. One of the metrics that's quite popular is CT min and CT max. And we've now analyzed these metrics, and it turns out these are almost a red herring for species distribution modeling. These values are so high that it is incredibly rare even to observe operative environmental temperatures in this range, um, which is why in the initial paper, I, I investigated the, the utility of CT Max pretty, pretty extensively in the science paper. There's, um, in the supplementary online materials, I show why there's very little information from these metrics. And I opted for T-PREF, thermal preference, the temperature that a, li a lizard or a um, frog would prefer in a laboratory grad gradient as the preferred metric for us. 
But you can see there's even more information encoded in the thermal performance curve because you can essentially integrate across, as temperatures oscillate in the environment, you can integrate what the observed performance would be for the fluoride frog anywhere in the species range for any time during the species' life history. And, and uh, we settled on time during the breeding season when these frogs are in the ponds. Um, so let me, let me just show you method one, the simple method where we use thermal preference and precipitation during and after the breeding season. And this assumes that hours of restriction, hours of activity, and precipitation um, during and after the breeding season, those four variables put in a species distribution modeling framework um, implemented. In this case, we've implemented all of this with um, one of the popular um, R-based routines called um, DISMO. We've actually now settled on DISMO because it allows us to develop very nice structural models. And DISMO was written by Robert Hymans at the University of California, Davis. So Chelonoidus denticulata, the yellow-footed tortoise of South America, is one of these species that's um, pretty iconic. It's um, found throughout the Amazon, so it's actually restricted largely to the tropical forest. And what we found is that Chelonoidus denticulata is a forest thermoconformer. What that means is that it has a much lower body temperature than its congener, Chelonoidus carbonaria, that is a heliotherm. And I'm going to use those terms throughout this rest of this talk. Oops. Trying to advance the slide. There we go. Okay, so Chelonoidus denticulata, the yellow-footed tortoise. Um, if you look at the observed species distribution in yellow on the left, um, you can compute the hours of potential activity across all of South America, and you can see the Andes shows up nicely. It's nice to know that there is no activity for the tortoises in the Andes. But you can also see that there is a very nice fit between the observed species distribution in terms of hours of activity, at least for the Amazonian part of the species range, and the observed species distribution. So if you just build a compute computed species distribution model based on one single parameter, hours of activity, you actually get very close to the species distribution. If you add one, this hours of activity and hours of ac restriction, you get a more complete picture. And if you add precipitation during the breeding season, you understand how its food resources are changing. And if you add hours of activity after the breeding season, you might build in more information about how the recruitment dynamics of juvenile um, yellow-footed tortoises may be impacted by changes in precipitation. Now what's going to happen in the Amazon, we know this very well, is that um, already we're seeing a drying in the eastern Amazon and that region is expanding and it's getting hotter. And what we're trying to do now is project what's going to happen to the Amazon tropical forest. So we actually have a companion grant down in Brazil to investigate what's happening to um, the Amazon Cejado species, and that's with Guarino Coli. He's um, heading up a very large collaboration in Brazil, perhaps as large as the collaboration that we have worldwide, spanning the Cejado on up to the Amazon forest sites. But this shows you why Chelonoidus denticulata is likely to go extinct from climate change rapidly. If we look at the, the pr predominant driver of extinction risk, you see that right now, or when in the contemporary, we think of the contemporary as being in 1975, what was this parameter? Basically, there were like less than two hours of restriction for Chelonoidus denticulata anywhere in the species range. It was actually kind of cool for the tortoises. That's why they evolved a very low body temperature. Now that they have this low body temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius, um, they are at great risk because as the forests warm, many of those sites in the interior of the tropical forest will actually exceed their preferred temperature. And so you kick in this hours of restriction here that flares up in the core of the species distribution, and that will drive the extinction of the yellow-footed tortoise. Okay, so that's just a very simple method that says how many hours does the, li does the tortoise or the lizard or the frog have above this preferred temperature in the environment. And because the yellow-footed tortoise is a thermal conformer, we can compute that simply from T min and T max, and then integrate the area um, above the thermal preference 
um, curve. Now here, the thermal performance curve has more information. So if this is temperature, we have jumping speed, so we can compute how, how much, how, how performance affects the four-eyed frog as the temperatures oscillate on a daily basis, say from in the Atacama Desert where um, Leo began his study, the northern limit of the species range, or in the center of the species range, um, you see differences in body temperature because in the Atacama, they go down to CT min very closely at night, but they get up to about 32, 33 degrees Celsius, and then we're integrating the area under this curve um, for jumping speed as temperatures oscillate on a daily basis. So the methods are actually incredibly simple. It's just some routines we've written in R to do these numerical integrations. Now, what was astounding to me was that if you take this metric, jumping performance right here, you can actually see by eye how well jumping performance of the four-eyed frog actually fits the core of the distribution. In green is the jumping performance where they have very high jumping performance, and you can see that it captures the core of the distribution. By the time that you get to the northern part of the range, it turns out that the jumping performance doesn't predict the distribution here, say, in the coast of Chile. But if you just do a simple um, um, augmentation to the model and assume that we can allow the frogs to acclimate, as Leo observes, he wrote a paper on the acclimation of these frogs. So if you acclimate them, say, to slightly higher temperatures, 25 degrees Celsius, which they'll now begin experiencing by 2080, the four-eyed frog will actually um, fit well the species distribution across the entire species range. So you can just add acclimation into these models as well, which makes them quite useful because one of the possible escapes from climate warming is acclimation. Well, regardless of whether the frogs can acclimate or not, I show you the predicted performance by 2080, and the only places that you'll find the four-eyed frog are at the base of the Andes and they've gone extinct from the entire region um, associated with the core of their distribution in Chile. So right now, Leo Basigalupe and I have a, a large-scale project that we envision developing for all the frogs of Chile, and we're also trying to do parallel work in the adjacent Patagonia here in Argentina with a large collaboration there. So method three, <clears throat> this is where we build in even more information. And um, just like we have lizard models that mimic the thermal properties of lizards, we developed another method that others had used where they used latex to build frog models, uh, molds, and here we're just coating a, a toad with latex. Eventually you build up the latex layers, and you can then stick a, ther a thermocouple probe from a data logger in there. You pour in an agar, and you basically can create little frogs that have exactly the same thermal properties as real frogs in the sun, in the shade, in wet sites, but they also have water loss rates that are virtually the same as a frog. And where the, the water loss rates differ, we can simply calibrate what the observed water loss rate of this frog is up against the real animal and measure the difference in water loss rates and just build that into the equations. Um, so we can correct for any differences between our model and our real species. So water loss rates evolve among frogs, and we have a large collaboration working on the evolution of the, this physiological trait. So from the point of view of obtaining information on the environment, we've now deployed an experiment along these lines. Um, in, in lizards, we like to put models in the sun and in the shade where lizards can retreat to when it gets warm. And that's how we essentially index the quality of the thermal environment. How good is a habitat for um, a lizard? The same thing for frogs, except we have to add to this. Um, we have dry sun sites and wet sun sites. So we actually do a factorial experiment where we um, uh, split it into dry versus wet. And then we also do day versus night. Because most of the frogs are nocturnal. But there are a number of diurnal species, so we can then measure the difference between the envi environment that the frog is experiencing during the day versus the night in these four different treatments. And so with a limited amount of equipment, it's possible to measure how much water the frogs lose and the body temperatures the frogs would experience in dry, sunny sites, wet, sunny sites, wet, shady sites, and 
um, dry shady sites. And where we don't have shade, we construct it, like with these cow pies here. Um, you can see the models tucked in under the cow pies. Or where we don't have water, we can add it. As we do, periodically we'll wet these frogs, um, just dribbling it in so it's like we're simulating a seep. So you can do this experiment. It's a real experiment that you can essentially standardize. And we've now done this. I think we're up to now several um, thousands of deployments of these frogs across the world. And now we're going to fill in a huge chunk of the information as we spin up this Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative um, project where we're doing this experiment at as many sites as we can. What's really nice about this experiment is that it can be done in a 24-hour period. What you do is you, in the, during the day, you replace the model every three to four hours. So you do it in the morning and you do it in the afternoon. And then you also do it over the nighttime. So it's a very simple, easy experiment to do. And there are extinctions of frogs in California. And we are indeed in the sixth mass extinction. Um, this was um, data, really kind of seminal data that Bob, Robert Fisher and Brad Schaefer collected, um, where they surveyed a number of different amphibian species. And uh, we began our work on the frogs of California looking at taxa like Spia hammondi, which have gone extinct from large regions of northern California compared to where they were present in earlier time frames. And also they've gone extinct from other regions. Um, um, and so what are these extinctions driven by? So for the frogs, I mean, there are many potential reasons for extinction. There's chytrid um, potentially causing the extinction. Jason Rohr and I have a, a, another grant from the National Science Foundation from the same um, granting program that we have our um, grant to measure the ecophysiology of frogs and reptiles, except the grant that Jason and I are working on involves the same kinds of things for the frogs, but also thermal performance curves for the chytrid growing on frogs. And so Jason's doing all these experiments on a number of different species. So we're, we're looking at chytrid in interaction with climate change, but you have pesticides being released into the environment across this landscape. You have other anthropogenic changes. So we're trying in California to actually develop an index of all of the potential risks of extinction um, and p potential agents of uh, extinction and trying to develop a picture of why the frogs have gone extinct in California, testing these hypotheses against the observed extinction data. Here we have extinctions of Bufo boreas. Enigmatically, this frog has very um, high water tolerances. They don't dry out very quickly, as you know. It's a toad. And yet we see large regions in which Bufo boreas has gone extinct. This is one of the poster childs. We're, we're now involved in a number of um, monitoring programs um, for Rana Aurora. Now it's, it's Rana Drayton and I in other areas, but this was the original name that um, Robert Fisher and Brad surveyed this species under. Brad Schaefer has since split the group up into a number of different taxa. But you see that it's now restricted in a large measure to sites around the Central Valley. This is a little bit old information. Other researchers have now found a few strongholds in the Sierras. So what's of great interest to us is that what is special about these strongholds where the red-legged frogs persist in the Sierras? And are there aspects of the environment that we can improve for the red-legged frogs? So on the California, uh, University of California Santa Cruz campus, we've now initiated a program with um, Gage Dayton, who holds the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service permit for our collaboration, and we're doing surveys. But importantly, what we're doing is we're looking at how potential mitigation might enhance the habitat. And so there are a number of willows that have grown up around the pond that is a remarkably wonderful pond for red-legged frog breeding here on the campus. And um, we're planning a set of experiments where we're going to do a willow removal. Um, and so what we're doing now with a student, Anna Ringelman, who's working with me and Gage, we're measuring the hydric and thermal environments of the frogs around the breeding pond and the egg masses in the breeding pond before the willow treatment this year. And then another student will, um, that we've already set up for next year will do the after um, experiment. But we have it set up so that we'll be splitting the pond into eight segments, four of which we leave intact, four of which we remove the willows, and we'll see how it impacts the thermal regulatory opportunities for the red-legged frog. And if this proves successful and we understand how to enhance the environment of the frogs, these, these techniques could be applied to other regions. 
So you can see that the ecophysiological method actually has great utility in, in looking at um, the quality of the environment for the frogs in such experiments, and we may be able to inform policy for um, species recovery efforts. So this shows you the kind of information you get um, from the agar models, how stark the information is. This shows you the water loss rate, so high values are bad for extinct versus persistent sites. And this is actually um, for um, a species that's not at risk of extinction for chytrid, um, which is the um, uh, Sudacris sieri, which is just a, it's a, a tree frog that we find in California. Now, the Sudacris sieri um, turns out to be pretty important from the point of view of um, ferreting out the causes of climate change. Sudacris sieri is not affected by chytrid, and so we're looking at the extinction risk of a species that has no chytrid risk. Now, to move, I just want to go over these effects briefly, but you can see that the mo models can actually be enhanced here we have the thermal performance curve. You can also look at the hydric performance curve. So as you dehydrate Bufo boreas, say, this was a paper presented by Priest and Poe in 1989, not 1089, um, pardon the typo. But it shows that the therm thermal performance curve shifts as you dehydrate frogs. And so under the stress of a dehydrating environment, the frogs are actually going to expect to change their thermal performance. You see that their optimum performance is quite a bit lower for these other regions. Um, I have a beeping phone, so I'm going to try to make sure that I don't lose contact uh, with you guys. I'll grab another phone here. And that way I'm good to go. Okay. Backup phone is here. So he here you see we're going to now develop these methods involving the thermal hydric performance curves. The models actually are very similar to the species distribution model. You have a main effect of temperature, hydration, quadratic effects of temperature that give you the curvature, and then you also have quadratic effects of hydration, as well as hydration by temperature. Now, um, this is, shows you what the fitted surface looks like. So just like we had the temperature performance curve, here you have the unified effects of temperature and hydration for the priest and post. I'm going to try this. I'm in conference. Good. Now I think I can actually turn off this other phone that's lost its battery, and I'm back in conference. <laughs> All right. All right. All charged up. Well, we've begun this work in detail with collaboration, collaborators in Brazil where they actually have measured the thermal and hydric performance curves of three different species. Here you see the maps of the species. Um, they have very different risks. Rinella Barry, it's a little hard to hear you now. Can you speak up or get closer? In the Atlantic forest because of deforestation, but also because the Atlantic forests are getting hotter. Many of you may know that Sao Paulo right now is in the midst of an intense drought. Um, and in fact, that's affecting all the biota around the Atlantic forest. Another species extends into the Sahado, and then another species extends into the Sahado greatly. And so it has a much um, more resistant um, skin, as well as it's resistant to temperature. The Sahado is like a savanna, for those of you that aren't familiar with the term. They also have different breeding periods, so we build in that information into the species distribution model. You can see that you can look at the physiology of the species, and you see they critically are significantly different in several important attributes, notably in the hydration level by temperature by species interaction. That means that they have a different shape to the curve, and that exacerbates um, or ameliorates their extinction risk. And let me just show you those curves. This is one of the species. And you can see that there's a ridge of interaction between temperature and hydration levels that makes the thermal performance change dramatically. As you vary hydration state, you go and dehydrate them, the temperature optimum changes for the species. The next species is not at, at, as a sensitive. The third species is not sensitive at all to dehydration. And this is the Sahado adapted species. 
So we're in the midst of actually doing these species distribution models based on um, thermal and hydric performance curves. These, these experiments require about two or three weeks to do, so we're only going to do these for targeted species, probably with the BUFOs of, of the desert southwest, but you can see that you can get some exquisite information. And because we're doing this with BUFOs worldwide, we can actually build up a picture of how extinction risk of these taxa is going to be affected. Okay, so the last method I'm going to discuss is this full demographic model. I'm just going to present this very briefly. This here we implement not only physiology but phylogenetic methods and we also test the models against deep climate. So this shows you the hours of restriction for um, desert tortoises during the breeding season and in blue is the hours of permissible activity. What you do is you build a curve, so this is how any of these species distribution models would work. So we build these hours of activity curves and hours of potential um, uh, activity in blue and restriction in red. And there is a function of the Tmax, the daily maximum air temperature, and the thermal preference, the evolved body temperature. And so this maps on how climate in interaction with physiology affect the operative environmental temperature that we express here in a behaviorally meaningful concept of having to retreat from the sun into their burrows versus being able to feed and eat the vegetation around them. Now, if we were talking about those other species distribution models, this would be some of the information that we just take and put into a species distribution modeling framework in Dismo, and we'd be done, and we actually capture tremendous information if we include precipitation. But for the gophers, we have the entire life table available to us, and we've now built functions for climate affecting the fecundity schedules and the adult survivorship schedules. And this is what those climate surfaces look like. So clutch size, the data that uh, Jeff Lovich and um, Josh Ennin assembled, appears to not be affected by hours of restriction or hours of activity. It's simply affected by winter precipitation, which, as I showed earlier, affects the growth of the vegetation that they feed on. But the curve for survivorship, adult survivorship, is profoundly affected by the interaction between temperature, as expressed as hours of restriction, and winter precipitation. It was from this curve that I discovered that you could simplify the methods that I'm showing you above. There is always a trait with which temperature interacts, and in this case, it's precipitation. And this is true for all those animals that I just showed you. Lizards are less affected by winter precipitation than the amphibians. But this showed me that there was a very simple way to leverage hours of restriction or temperature, so we're just scaling the Tmax surfaces with another variable like winter precipitation that affects their foraging ability. Now what I show you in red would be the simple approach that we came up with in 2010. We said that above a critical limit, hours of restriction critical, we hypothesized that the demography of the tortoises would collapse. And this shows you that that hypothesis is actually correct. Our simple-minded approach in the 2010 paper essentially captures the cliff across which the desert tortoises plummet because it just gets too hot to survive. And that you can see that there's a really nice optimum over here where you get very low winter precipitation, but for any winter precipitation there is a unique optimum until you get to the point where you get essentially like full winter precipitation and very low hours of restriction, the tortoises can live forever. The problem is, if I go back to this panel for clutch size, at these high precipitations, they can't breed. So where, whereas they can survive forever, they can't breed here. So there's yet another curve that's modifying this, which would be the clutch size curve. So you get this very nice species distribution kind of climate envelope built on ecophysiology and demography. This shows you, very briefly, if we apply, take the data here for Gophers agazizii, and apply it to all the tortoises across the West, this shows you how good the AUC score is. It's about 0.92. I show you also taking a, another published method on um, uh, the AUC score that you would project for the other species of tortoises using a public, published method for the tortoises, and you get a much lower AUC score, the area under the curve. Now, 
we can simply take, we don't even need demography, we used just the ecophysiology and looked at the ADC scores, they're nearly as high as that that we obtain with the demography. This shows you how climate will evolve by 2080. The desert tortoise's range becomes fragmented. By 20, uh, 2020, sorry, by 2080, the desert tortoise is essentially extinct from its known range across the West. I'm going to zoom in on this. It shows that we actually have desert tortoise present today potentially in Kansas or other parts of Mexico. There are some species of desert tortoise that aren't predicted to be extinct, but basically from, from um, North America we predict the extinctions of, of the large numbers of tortoises. This shows you how the model works at a very low spatial scale of California for just gopher sagazizii. These are museum records for gopher sagazizii, and this shows you the, in blue the high occupancy. It predicts that we should see gopher sagazizii in the Central Valley, and there were actually fossils of gopher sagazizii. We hypothesized that they were eaten out by Paleo-Indians out of the Central Valley, and we're now searching for Paleo-Indian sites where we can verify that. Hey, Barry, can you hear me? The entire species distribution range of the gophers collapses. We have a few refugia. I have another talk that I'm going to be giving at the BLM at the end of the month down in Southern California, and I show in that talk I'm going to show that these sites right here are exactly where people are trying to build out solar, and I, I argue that that may in fact not be good for the desert tortoise. So that's a presentation that I'm doing down at the BLM. Um, I guess it's in Riverside that was arranged by Al Mute for me. So we also use much more high information, high quality information on regional climate models. This was one developed by a number of researchers here at the University of California, and we just apply the gophers model to these, and it, it essentially says that the gophers will be extinct. It confirms that at a much higher level, but this is how we can inform the public. If you imagine that this is a desert adapted species, then basically California's Central Valley becomes a desert, as on par with the Mojave Desert. So around the region of Sacramento where the lawmakers are going to be making their laws by 2070, we could actually seed those areas with desert tortoise and they would thrive. But that's, a, that's now being converted to a, a, a desert region. With other members of a research consortium, we're looking at whether native plants, like from the Mojave, might actually exist in the Central Valley that we're going to convert into a desert. Because there's a whole biodiversity here of native plants that are at risk of extinction as well. This shows you how well the model works over paleo time frames. This is the paleo distribution of gophers. During the Miocene and Eocene, the hottest times in the last 65 million years, they were way up north. In the Pliocene and early Pleistocene, they were in this region. And during the Pleistocene, they basically oscillated in, the, in their current distribution. This shows you climate change and shows you how hot it was in the Eocene. It was very, very hot. In fact, we've now achieved Miocene levels of carbon, so we're guaranteed to get up to these levels if the climate modelers are correct. So it's going to get hot. It's guaranteed to get hot. This shows you where the gophers were in the Eocene based on our model, and this is exactly where the gophers were present in the Eocene based on the fossil data. There is another fossil locality way over here in the Miocene that I didn't show on the previous map. It appears in the Miocene right here, and you can see why. This is likely to be, have been a really good area for the tortoises. Incidentally, California wasn't present here in the Eocene. It was built up by continental plate tectonics. So I just want to briefly touch upon these effects. In, in the new modeling, what we do is we build in phylogenetic effects so we can understand the evolving thermal physiology. So they're much more complicated, but we use existing information on the temperatures of the tortoises. We can look at paleo events that were responsible for the diversification of tortoises as a function of evolved physiology or extinction events. And this was an event that occurred after the Eocene, everything cooled, and the environment kind of opened up and new, new types of tortoises could evolve. Ancestrally, tortoises were all heliothermic, uh, thermal conforming, but during this episode, the cooling that occurred during the Oligocene allowed for the expansion of tortoises across the world and radiation, significant radiation, because they could evolve these new heliothermic traits. And, and then since then, they've essentially locked in on these, and you don't see much diversification. Now, the Miocene was hot, and it's just going to get as hot as the Eocene, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. So we can compare you know, various traits like modes of thermal regulation, 
thermal conforming versus the actual body temperatures that the tortoises have in the present day and reconstruct temperatures in the past. I just want to show you just how the modern day scenarios of climate change and extinction of tortoises um, in the desert southwest and their presumable expansion into these regions is as eerily similar to what happened when, during the hottest times. So during the Pliocene, there was a corridor, and we're experiencing Pliocene-like temperatures now in the 20, by 2020. And so this region expands, and you can see that the projections for 2020 are for tortoises to really expand into this region. And then it, expanding into the Central Valley, but also these Kansas sites, as they did during the Eocene, um, I, in, during the Eocene as well as during the future cast. So these hey, are these Barry. scenarios. Barry. It shows you you can take the models and apply the models up to the entire globe. These are Eocene reconstructions of where tortoises would be depending on what temperature they are. I don't want to go too much into the details of this. So I just want to summarize. I think that we're going to face a tremendous challenge with the extinctions of reptiles and amphibians across the, the world, but also across the desert southwest. We're going to have to envision new scenarios and perhaps even rewilding scenarios um, and uh, in this bold new future that we enter. And I just want to highlight a couple of key collaborators that I've had over the years. This is Ray Huey over here in the guise of Spock and um, Don Miles, who's been working on all the ecophysiology and developing the methods for ecophysiology over the last uh, 20 years, holding on to the tortoise that we're trying to resuscitate. So um, at that point, I can open the floor for questions. And um, any of those, I, I guess, uh, Amy, I don't know how we do this, but I'll leave it open. Here. Barry, can you hear me? Are you there? I have the presentation participants list. Barry, can you hear me? I hear you. OK. <laughs> Um, we're, we're actually over time, um, so I just want to take a moment to thank folks who, are, who need to go and were able to join us. But um, Barry, if you're able to stay a few minutes, we could take a couple questions. Oh, yeah, no problem. I see Judy has a question. So Judy, if you press star six, that will unmute your line. The question was from 15 minutes ago, because when you changed phones, I no longer could hear anything you were saying. Oh. What happened? I don't know. Not uh, sure. I was trying to get your attention um, to have you speak up or speak yeah, closer to the phone. On this. So Sorry if this is happening. going to be videotaped and available later, I will look forward to listening to the last 15 minutes that I missed. Okay, I can redo the last 15 minutes if there was an audio problem. We'll, we'll see how it turns out in the video. Really sorry. I had a phone that was dying. Um, I know the part that last 15 minutes was the tortoise thing, so I can just redo that for the audience. <laughs> well, we'll see how the, thanks for your patience, Judy, and we'll see how the video turns out um, and, yeah. and whether or not we need to redo any of it. Um, are there any other questions? Do you see uh, any hands raised there, Barry? Not yet, no. Okay, folks, if you do have a question, you can raise your hand on the participants panel. Okay, well, we are over time now. So, um, Barry, is there a way that people can contact you if they have questions? Email um, lizardrps at gmail.com. Great. And um, I want to thank you, Barry. Um, you covered a lot of information uh, in a short period of time um, and are obviously very passionate about the work that you do. Um, sure, so we, yeah. Thank you very much for that. I want to thank everyone uh, who made time to be with us today. And apologies for the, um, the audio um, in the last several minutes. It was a little difficult to hear you, Barry. Um, I could still hear you, but not as well. Um, so we'll see yeah, how that turns out in the video. One phone seems to have not hit the speaker phone. So that's where um, the problem arose. But I can redub the um, last 15 minutes for the presentation. Okay, well, we'll see how it turns out. Um, it may be that, you know, just turning up the volume will be enough because I, I could hear you. It was harder to hear you, but I could hear you. So um, hopefully that video will turn out. Yeah. Um, so thanks very much. Yeah.
Thanks very much to everyone. Um, special thanks to some folks behind the scenes. Andrew Wickhorst, a graduate research assistant with the Desert LCC, who helped us set up this webinar, and Victoria Stengel with the U.S. Geological Survey, who is our webinar guru. Uh, many thanks to everyone, and uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.